Hello, everyone, and welcome to this ninth Geopolitical Economy Hour, the fortnightly show on the political and geopolitical economy of our times. I'm Radhika Desai. And I'm Michael Hudson. And today we have a special guest, Professor Mick Dunford. Mick is Professor Emeritus at Sussex University and a visiting scholar at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And his work focuses on world development, especially of Eurasia and, and, and China. Mick, Mick is going to help us discuss uh, the political and geopolitical economy today of the Ukraine conflict. The conflict is dragging on. The much-anticipated spring offensive has started and is sputtering. Western propaganda is beginning to portray what is what we know is in many cases a bloodbath for Ukraine as a triumph. President Zelensky is jetting around Europe, European capitals, eliciting very uncertain promises of help. Western powers are filling Ukraine with what somebody recently called a zoo of incompatible weapons and weapon systems of different vintages. The EU continues imposing ever newer sets of sanctions while President Biden continues to proclaim his support for Ukraine's cause as long as it takes to regain its 1991 borders, which of course includes Crimea. So all of this is going on. We know there is much that is puzzling about the conflict. And today what we want to do is follow the money on the conflict. Wars are not just fought with arms, strategies and tactics. Armies march, as they say, on their bellies. So what is the political and geopolitical economy of this conflict? While the mainstream press makes it sound as if the West is involved in the conflict entirely altruistically, standing up for Western values and democracy, even as it supports, by the way, an ever more fascist government in, in Kiev, a few critical uh, sources do focus on the profits that are being made by arms production. But what we, we think we will be able to show in the course of this hour is that, in fact, the underlying political economy and geopolitical economy is far more complex. So what we've decided to do is organize the conversation by country and region. So we will first discuss uh, the, uh, uh, points relating to Ukraine, then we'll come to Russia, then we'll come to Europe, then we'll go to the US, then we'll discuss China, and then the rest of the world. So that's roughly how we want to do it. And so beginning with Ukraine, you know, what I find really remarkable about the, uh, uh, the whole uh, sort of economic situation in Ukraine is that normally when a country is at war, you'd expect that uh, the country pulls together. The government creates policies of that are egalitarian. You know, in the in the uh, uh, course of the conflict uh, in, in the Second World War in Britain, there was talk of fair shares and equal sacrifices. But what you find in Ukraine now is absolutely the opposite. What you are looking at in Ukraine is what we may call neoliberalism on steroids. The Zelensky government, as even as it is conducting a war, which is very often a kind of show war anyway, but it is supposedly at war, it is fighting a, a, a great enemy. Meanwhile, the government is implementing exceedingly anti-labor legislation. It has banned the opposition that will try to resist that. Uh, and it is privatizing all sorts of state assets uh, in order to finance the war. So you're essentially selling off the family silver in order to pay for an ongoing expense. Um, and what's more, uh, the, the, the privatizations include the very, very fertile land of Ukraine. And it is not being privatized to ordinary farmers or anything. On the contrary, the land is being sold off to large agribusiness. So every time you hear about, you know, uh, 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 how urgent it is that Ukrainian grain has to get out to world markets, it's not the interests of ordinary farmers that are being protected, Ukrainian farmers on the contrary, these big agribusinesses must get their, their products out for sale. So this is what's going on. There's, and in, in many other ways as well, private enterprise is deeply involved. Every time there is a, a loan being given to Ukraine, um, private sector uh, operators, big financial institutions are involved. And of course, the IMF has given, uh, 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 is uh, funneling money to, to, to Ukraine in, in a various ways and so on. Don't you think, Michael, isn't that really quite an exceptional state of things for a country yes. at war? 
Well, it certainly is. Uh, and in the press discussion every day, uh, it's obviously about the military, but the military discussion about whether there's going to be uh, a counterattack by Ukraine, uh, the military situation is all what they're really talking about is Ukraine has to make some victory so that it can now uh, negotiate peace with the Russians and, and install exactly the neoliberal policy that you've described. Uh, there's no way in which that can happen. I think we should say at the beginning uh, what uh, uh, the other side uh, has to say. And I think uh, uh, Russia's Foreign Secretary Lavrov uh, made it clear uh, in May 4th. He said, everyone understands the geopolitical nature of what is happening. And everyone understands that without resolving the main geopolitical problem, which is the desire of the West to maintain its hegemony and dictate to everyone and all its will, it's impossible to solve any crisis, either in the Ukraine or in other parts of the world. So uh, you, you can see right now uh, how the U.S. has been preparing for that. Every day, certainly in the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, there is a list of all of the war crimes that Russia has been uh, allegedly committing in Ukraine, uh, beginning with uh, faked up uh, massacres, the Bakhmut uh, massacre, uh, and uh, all of the attacks. So uh, the, the U.S. is uh, accumulating a bill that now uh, the New York Times says is uh, $2 trillion uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, will have to pay the West in order to uh, become solvent once the fighting is over. And uh, the U.S. says, well, uh, we're already preparing a war crimes trial in the uh, International Criminal Court against Russia uh, for uh, what this is going to be, a list of damages uh, to charge Russia uh, uh, so that uh, uh, Ukraine can begin to pay. But of course, the war crimes trial is going to take uh, years and years. And in the meantime, Ukraine is going to have to sell off exactly the uh, all of its assets that you've mentioned. It'll have to sell off its agriculture uh, to Man Monsanto. It'll sell off its gas rights at the Chevron. It, it's, it's, uh, the U.S. has hired BlackRock, uh, the Wall Street uh, firm, to make a repertory of all of the assets Ukraine has and how they will be sold uh, to U.S. buyers. Well, the whole question is, uh, uh, what will uh, what will uh, happen? Uh, will that really be sold off? Well, how can it be sold off if the uh, sellers are a government that was installed by a coup d'état? Uh, a government is uh, will actually itself has become a terrorist government, and the money that is received for uh, these special privileges are actually uh, turned over to uh, the kleptocrats uh, and to the government officials to put in their own accounts. Uh, and uh, much of it has uh, actually been recycled into uh, campaigns for the uh, U.S. Congress, the U.S. senators and uh, U.S. politicians. And uh, that is sort of a key economic aspect of this that hasn't been uh, discussed apart from Hunter Biden's laptop, uh, where he promised uh, to pay Hunter Biden and the big man, presumably the father, uh, to act as lobbyists uh, for Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we know that much of the money that has been donated to Ukraine has been paid by Ukraine on public relations uh, agencies and lobbyists uh, to uh, pay uh, senators and representatives. But also, uh, when you have BlackRock in charge of neoliberalizing and carving up the Ukrainian economy, uh, uh, the senators and uh, congressmen can expect campaign contributions, not only from Ukraine, but from BlackRock, from Chevron, from uh, all of the other countries, companies that are able to buy uh, a killing there. Well, uh, what is the response? And I think uh, one what uh, uh, I want to point out is uh, there, Russia obviously needs its own criminal court. It needs a shadow court to say, yes, of course there has been, uh, the uh, the aggressor must pay uh, reparations. The aggressor in this case is the U.S. and NATO. We are owed money. We're not the pays. And uh, this uh, these assets in Ukraine, especially in the uh, Russian part that are now part of Russia, are not Ukraine's to sell. Uh, they are our assets now. 
they are Russian assets, and we are not going to sell them to the West, and we are not going to install the neoliberal program uh, that is uh, uh, in, uh, being proposed by the West. So uh, there's obviously going to be a standoff for a number of years, and that standoff will uh, have to go beyond just uh, an international criminal court by the global majority, but a whole set of uh, counter institutions to counter, for instance, uh, the IMF, which is lending uh, money to Ukraine in violation of its articles of agreement, lending to a country at war, lending to a government that is uh, uh, anything but uh, democratic uh, to uh, to fight the war. So I think uh, we may have a little back and forth here before we finish Ukraine, but to get into this, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, the economic solution can only be settled on the battlefield. Uh, everybody agrees with that. Uh, the, the U.S. is expecting Ukraine to win on enough on the battlefield so that they can say, let's stop and talk. Uh, and Russia says, uh, uh, made it very clear, uh, we're not going to stop and talk. We are going to continue to uh, put our national security demands up front. And uh, this is not something that's going to end this year or next year or even the year after. Mick, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I just want to pick up on uh, what Michael said about the way in which uh, neoliberalism is seen as um, the way forward from this point in, in time. And I want, I want to do that by talking about the way in which neoliberalism, the way in which a particular path to transition, the way in which um, a country in which ethnic nationalists came to power through a series of successive revolution, uh, color revolutions laid the foundations, or many of the foundations for the current crisis. And I'd like um, Paul to show a slide if he would. It's very interesting, you know, that in uh, 1991, the Ukrainian ethnic nationalists of whom Gorbachev had actually warned Bush envisaged that Ukraine would very quickly become another France. In fact, what happened was that Ukraine, in a sense, actually went backwards. In 1989 to 91, there were a series of transformations in Europe in which many of the communist countries in Europe collapsed and undertook transitions to capitalism. And in 1989, there was an attempted revolu color revolution, which failed in China. This chart simply depicts the growth of GDP in a number of these transition countries from 1989. 1989 is equal to 100. Of the East European countries, the one that did best was Poland. It reached, you know, by 2019, an index of 251.7. But Poland received huge sums of cohesion fund support from the European Union. Of these countries, the one that did second best was actually Belarus, which did not adopt a neoliberal path. If, however, you look at Ukraine, you find that it, on the, in, in 2019, right before uh, the major impact of the current conflict, but obviously reflecting in part the conflict that started in 2014, stood at just 56.8, 56 percent of where it was in 1989. That represents a catastrophic economic collapse as a result of the path of transition that was adopted in that country. If one looks at China, I record the Chinese index. The Chinese index starting at 100 in 1989 in 2019 was 1,480. I want you to just think about those two numbers. You can compare Poland, 251.7, Belarus, 56.8, China, 1,480. So in a sense, you know, this particular neoliberal path led to an economic catastrophe. It also led to a demographic catastrophe because the country had 51.3 million people in 1989, 1993. It had dropped to about 41 million by 2014. Today, it is probably about 31 million. About 5.5 million refugees are in China, another 4.5 million in the European Union. Its population has collapsed because deaths exceed births. So it has very little prospect, you know, of seeing sustained population growth in the years to come. So in a sense, I just wanted to document these economic and demographic aspects of a catastrophe that has led to this, this tragedy. 
No, that's that really is very important. And what we are seeing now in the context of the war is that these policies are actually being further enhanced, by, and including by the fact that the Zelensky government has used the excuse of the war to ban all opposition, which means that the opposition to these policies cannot be voiced, essentially. And uh, of course, what you are also saying about the demographic collapse, uh, both before and then uh, during the war, uh, with so many refugees in Russia and elsewhere, um, I, I think it also shows that, you know, the irony of the fact is that everyone who says stand up for Ukraine and we are going to defend Ukraine is actually contributing to the systematic destruction of Ukraine. This is one of the ironies of the present situation. And, you know, another thing uh, about the sort of political economy of all this that really strikes me as extremely, I mean, scandalously hypocritical, shockingly hypocritical, is that all the arms that are being sent, uh, especially by the United States, states but also by other countries they are always portrayed as you know we are giving ukraine arms none of these arms are being given the united states and other countries are selling these arms and if ukraine cannot pay as it indeed cannot they are running up a tab at the end of this war, whatever entity that survives or, uh, to which the na name Ukraine can be stuck will be saddled with this bill. And I I don't think all, all the money that they will confiscate from this Russian oligarch or that Russian oligarch, central bank reserves and whatnot, will come anywhere near to be a, you know to, to paying for this. And so essentially, whatever the people who remain in Ukraine will be working very hard to pay off this debt. And again, it is a debt, remember, that has been incurred for a completely illegitimate purpose. Ukraine would have remained, okay, Ukraine was not very prosperous, but it would have retained what little 56.8% of its 1989 prosperity. It would have retained that substantially and maybe even done better had they signed the Minsk agreements. But the West, by egging Ukraine on not to sign the Minsk agreements, has essentially created this situation. And what's more, Western corporations, financial, ag agribusiness and all sorts in are basically already profiting from it. They were profiting, as Mick, you pointed out, already before the uh, before this conflict began uh, through all the color revolutions and the implementation of neoliberal policies and so on, which goes back certainly to 2014 and much earlier than that as well. Mm -hmm. But also in the context of the present war, they while the war is going on, while the country is at war, Western corporations are benefiting by buying up productive assets and uh, uh, and essentially exploiting Ukrainian labor with even with, you know, essentially with, with, with a labor legislation that is totally loaded in favor of big corporations. Well, the, the, the question is, uh, what is Ukraine going to be for all of this? Uh, when you talk about the uh, neoliberalism, there's no way that this neoliberal program can be applied to uh, Donetsk or to Luhansk or to Odessa, if that's taken over. So uh, what we're talking about is a kind of rump state uh, of Ukraine in which uh, it's possible even uh, Lvov may be turned over uh, to Poland. Uh, it's going to be uh, carved up. So uh, the, uh, the argument is going to be, what is the Ukraine that is going to uh, uh, pay these debts? And uh, certainly any agreements that uh, the, the proxy government has made and any debts that they've run into uh, can be repudiated on the grounds of odious debts. Uh, now, obviously, if uh, the United mm -hmm. States uh, Im imposes a uh, puppet government, a client oligarchy, they're not going to raise uh, the issue of uh, odious debts. There is no, as you just pointed out, the political system is such that labor has no representation there. So you would have a, 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 a Ukraine that's lost half of its population that's living abroad now, and is not, uh, there's nothing to go back to for it. Uh, and uh, uh, much of the population is in the uh, Russian speakers. Uh, so there's going to be literally something that is not really a country. There, it, you can think of it as an economic entity that uh, somehow is, controls uh, the raw materials we've mentioned, uh, the land that's not poisoned by uh, uranium 
uh, uh, bullets and uh, made radioactive. Uh, we're talking about a kind of uh, not really not really a country, uh, but a, uh, even the definition of uh, how to put in the new laws is going to have to await a settlement of the political boundaries that is, uh, I don't see that happening within the foreseeable future. Yeah, so, absolutely. Okay. So, so absolutely. I mean, basically, what what we have, what we are all uh, ending up saying is that the, the present conflict, the war, has simply been the occasion for further acceleration of neoliberal transformation of yes. Ukraine. That's what the West is getting. Meanwhile, of course, ordinary Ukrainians, many of them maybe even quite idealistic, are being signed up to go and fight and die. Uh, for a cause which is not even the cause of their liberation, but a cause of the destruction of their country. I mean, this is the horrific situation in Ukraine. Um, maybe if we are done with Ukraine, we, we can... Uh, Mick, did you want to add anything more about Ukraine? I mean, no, the only thing I was would have added is that, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at Mariupol, you know, I mean, there's already quite a significant process of, of reconstruction of housing with people being provided with 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 new new accommodation there have been quite major investments in in, in transport infrastructure there have been attempts to address the problems of water supply of the Crimea so I I, I suspect you know that those parts of uh, Ukraine that have become parts of the Russian Federation may well see, you know, very substantial public investment, you know, in order to try to, I mean, well, so much has been destroyed, you know, to actually restore the infrastructure and to start to re-establish public services and maybe to get some of these uh, economic activities working again to provide people with livelihoods. But obviously that involves, you know, that will involve massive uh, financial investments and very careful planning. Absolutely. And that's that's a, that's a good segue into our next topic, which is Russia. So, you know, I would say what 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 are the most general things you can say uh, about the situation in Russia? Well, recall that when the conflict began, President Biden uh, claimed that he was going to impose such sanctions that were going to uh, what was how did he put it? That were going to reduce the ruble to rubble. And that were going to uh, uh, set back the Russian economy, uh, you know, uh, massively. It was going to destroy the Russian economy. Uh, instead, what we've seen is that the Russian economy has actually proved very resilient. And in fact, in many ways, the sanctions have been boomeranging, causing more uh, harm to the imposers of the sanctions, whether it's the European Union or the US itself, particularly the dollar system and so on, um, and, uh, in, and instead of instead of hurting Russia. So Russia has proved resilient against sanctions. And this story itself also goes back to 2014, because in 2014, as people may recall, a first batch of sanctions were imposed on Russia. And in response to that, those sanctions, the Russian government did undertake a number of initiatives to to essentially sanctions proof its economy. And one of the big success stories of that sanction proofing was, in fact, the Russian agricultural sector, when the, uh, 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 which in fact has been has proven to be a success story. And is uh, Russia is today a major exporter, not only of grain and, and food products and so on, but it also exports fertilizers, as we saw uh, in an earlier phase of the conflict, when there was a great deal of concern about the disruption of uh, supplies of fertilizer from Russia. Russia. And Russia has also, in uh, over the last year or so, demonstrated a capacity for keeping up production. One of the other things that, that occurs to me is that, you know, in the West, with all the uh, uh, weapons being supplied and sold to Ukraine, the stockpiles have been depleted, whereas Russia has demonstrated a capacity to continue manufacturing weapons and essentially to win uh, uh, to win uh, wars uh, uh, in Russia. So, so in that sense, and, and last point I'd like to make is that all of this has been done in a context where, although the government has stepped up its level of economic uh, of of state intervention in order to create a more productive economy, become more of a developmental state, there are many in Russia who argue that not enough has been done on this front, and more can be done. The central bank's policy, uh, policies, the Russian central bank's policies, could be more. 
uh, 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 anti-neoliberal than they are. Uh, the government could also uh, essentially mobilize the economy on a war footing. And actually, instead of, you know, uh, in Russia, we are, you know, the IMF predicted that the Russian economy would be set back by about 12 to 14 percent. And in the end, in 2022, it was set back by a mere 2 percent. But many people would argue, Sergei Glazyev is, is, is one of them, who says, actually, if you mobilize the economy, you would not only not have a setback of a mere 2 percent, which is certainly something to celebrate but actually have a russian economic boom which could still be possible well what russia wants to do uh is to turn what is going to be a victory militarily in ukraine into uh, an overall new economic order that's what uh, both uh, putin and lavrov have talked about and they they've also pointed out that economic and political resolutions of the ukraine conflict go together so uh, Russia, at the very outset, uh, is going to ask Ukraine uh, and the United States to admit that the fake massacre in Bakhmut uh, and other accusations of war crimes uh, were faked. And Russia is going to, I would hope, make its own list of Ukrainian, American, and British war crimes against Ukraine, including uh, now depleted uh, uranium, uh, and uh, present its own bill for money uh, that is owed. Uh, which probably will be much more. There will be a whole uh, argument about who started the war. Did the war start in 2014 with the coup d'etat? Uh, or did it start with the uh, buildup of Ukrainian to attack Luhansk and uh, uh, Donetsk uh, just, uh, just before February of uh, uh, last year? Uh, or did it just start uh, with Russia coming in, uh, as uh, every American official document says, unprovoked? Well, uh, the war crimes trial is going to be run by the Russians, probably with other global south uh, world majority uh, countries, uh, China and others. And the objective is going to be to restructure not only uh, uh, NATO Ukraine, but NATO China uh, and U.S. Uh, relations with the global majority uh, altogether. Uh, and uh, what Russia realizes uh, is that uh, whatever comes out of this, whatever peace agreement is negotiated, can only be established on the battlefield. That's why Russia cannot uh, uh, afford to lose uh, the war, and why uh, in the New York Times, uh, uh, Mr. Friedman uh, comes out and says, uh, Russia has now expanded right to the tip of uh, uh, NATO. It's Russia that's expanding uh, to NATO instead of NATO expanding uh, to Russia. So I think what Russia is going to come out with is its own Monroe Doctrine. And it's going to say, keep out of the Black Sea and keep also out of the Northern Pacific. Uh, it can coordinate this with China, uh, keeping foreign ships out of the uh, China Straits. Uh, the Ukraine war is going, uh, is going to set a whole model for uh, what's happening in Taiwan, uh, in China, uh, and all over uh, the world, far outside of uh, Ukraine. And uh, the United States uh, essentially has uh, seized the holdings of Russian oligarchs, and we've talked about seizing Russia's reserves. Uh, and these, uh, these uh, holdings of Russian oligarchs were uh, bought with the money that they paid uh, the privatized companies uh, to uh, U.S. Uh, and foreign borrowers. So uh, Russia can uh, economically respond by nullifying all foreign holdings of U.S. of uh, Russian stocks that are held in by U.S. holders and NATO holders. Say, wait a minute! You've not only stolen from Ukraine; you've stolen in Russia. Let's uh, let's have a global settlement of all this. Uh, these uh, the you did to Russia first. What you uh, uh, did to Ukraine, we're going to cancel all uh, stocks and bonds owed to uh, uh, U.S. and NATO holders, uh, simply nullify them uh, to uh, reverse the sell-off of uh, uh, the Russian industry. And that's like um, that could be a model for the same thing to be done to Ukraine uh, in calculating the damages and reparations that uh, uh, America, Britain, and Germany uh, owe uh, to Ukraine. Mick, please go ahead. I, guess, I mean, Michael spoke about um, a new economic order. Um, I, I think it's quite interesting to ask why, you know, when from the 1990s, Russia put forward proposals for economic integration of Eurasia from Lisbon to Vladivostok, when it spoke about indivisible security, when it expected that the 
the verbal and written commitments made to Gorbachev concerning the non-expansion of NATO would be respected. And we now learn from Jeffrey Sachs that NATO started to plan the inclusion even of Ukraine in 1991, 1992, which is astonishing. But in a, in a sense, these, these constructive proposals were repudiated by the United States and also by the European Union. An important question, you know, one needs to ask is why? I mean, obviously there are and many reasons, and there are complicated explanations. But clearly, you know, what this conflict has done is it's disrupted the Belt and Road Initiative. It's divided Russia and Germany. It obviously is presumably intended to prevent the emergence of a significant Eurasian land power that could challenge the leadership of the United States. In the case of the EU, I mean, the EU is only interested in economic integration on, in, on its terms, which means, you know, which it says respect its values. But I think what it means by its values are a political order in which it's easy to interfere externally and an economic order in which all resources are essentially available to sale to everyone and anyone, which tends to deny, you know, less developed parts of the world the prospects of uh, engaging in a form of catch-up catch up development. And I think in, you know, it's in the light of that bitter experience, you know, that, that Russia has formulated a new foreign policy. And I mean, that new foreign policy is extremely interesting because it involves, on the one hand, a reorientation of Russia towards the East, the establishment of closer relationships with East Asia, with Southeast Asia, with India. But it also involves the redefinition of Russia as a, as a, as a civilization state. I mean, for a long time, since Peter the Great, you know, Russia, in a sense, modeled itself on the West. And I think it's the malfeasance of the West has actually persuaded it that there has to be another way forward. And in a sense, this notion of a civilization state is a notion that's also used in relation to China. You could use it in relation to India, in relation to the countries of the Islamic world. And the thing that's quite interesting about it is if you actually say, look, at, you look at East Asia, until, until, 1894, East Asia was at peace for 300 years. If you take out, you know, if you, if you just look at China, it was at peace for 500 years. These countries did not engage in forms of external expansion and colonialism. So in a sense, there's a profound difference in the kind of civilizational values you know, of these East Asian civilizations and Western civilization in which capitalism emerged and imperialism and colonialism. And in a sense, that's associated with a, a radically different conception of the international order. You know, I think you know, Russia has now come to, you know, in its close relationship with China, and especially in terms of the way in which it's defined its new foreign policy. And that, in a sense, is a hope, you know, that we might all, in the years ahead, you know, come to live in a more peaceful world in which we're not constantly faced with a succession of wars as we have been, you know, basically in the last 500 years, you know, since the rise of Western colonialism and imperialism. No, I, that's exactly the word. The word you ended with is exactly what I was going to talk about, because, you know, oh. it is about imperialism. You know, why is it, you know, you said Jeffrey Sachs noted that, you know, uh, the Americans were planning as early as 1990, 1991 to integrate Ukraine into NATO, etc. The reason for that is that essentially what, what has ruled the world, uh, what has determined how the different parts of the world relate to each other for the last couple of hundred years has been Western imperialism. Why do we have Western imperialism? Because of Western capitalism. What is the purpose of Western imperialism? To constantly open up more and more parts of the world so that, to, to, so that Western corporations based in the West could have access to markets, to investment opportunities and profit opportunities and cheap labor and cheap materials and so on and so forth. And so, of course, uh, uh, you know, and, and Russia has always been a, uh, seen as a big prize for the West. I mean, essentially, the Anglo-American interest, so to speak, the lib so-called liberal and the most aggressively imperialist interest is of, of the West has always uh, looked upon Russia as being too big and therefore, you know, something that should be uh, broken down, etc. And this is also important. It's also important to talk about this because... Western imperialism is often uh, 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 ignored while the Russian Empire or the Chinese Empire, and we are being always being told that these countries are being imperialist. But as you rightly pointed out, Mick, 
these civilizations have lived peacefully and they have been used to living peacefully for centuries. Whereas what you have seen with the onset of Western capitalism is nothing but endless war. And the purpose of these wars is exactly this. So, 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 so I think that, and, and I also like to make one, I mean, I completely agree with you that of course, since Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, Russia did look to the West, but the purpose of looking to the West was not in fact, to model itself on the West, but rather to essentially partner with the West to create Russian prosperity. But this is exactly because the West is imperialist. It is precisely this prosperity that was not possible in close relation with the West. That is why the pinnacle of a Russian uh, productive achievement was under the Soviet Union when it was not, in fact, connected with the West. So in that sense, I would say that... Um, what Russia has realized now, and this was very clear in my last visit to Russia, uh, uh, two quick uh, 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 reminiscences. Number one, we attended a major economic conference uh, and even like two or three years ago, that conference would have been dominated by neoliberal intellectuals. This time around, the overwhelming majority of the speakers were decidedly anti-neoliberal. And uh, there were a couple of neoliberals, but they were sort of, you know, one or two in a, in a sea of a general consensus about creating a developmental state in Russia, having closer relations with China, moving away from the West, etc. So that's number one. Number two, another uh, 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 conference uh, I attended was, you know, began by the chair. Again, it, this took place at the, in the home of uh, uh, neoliberalism in Russia, which is the higher school of economics, which was set up after 1991 precisely to be a sort of beehive for neoliberal thinking. Um, this is where this session began by the chair, essentially, the first speaker essentially saying that when this war ends, Russia will no longer turn to the West. That chapter is finished. Russia is looking to the East. And the session ended by the chair saying, the fact of the matter is Russia does not want to become closer to the West. The West is boring. The East is where everything is happening. So in that sense, yes, Washington, the Washington consensus has now been universally rejected. And the longstanding question of whether Russia is European or Eurasian has been decisively settled. So in this sense, I would say that uh, the, uh, there are many uh, 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 trends essentially going, moving in, uh, in an anti-neoliberal direction. There is room for more, and I think Russia can come out of this uh, 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 as a much more productive society, provided it manages to, you know, not just build resilience against sanctions, but actually, you know, learn how, you know, a mix a, a, a graph showed that in the last, uh, uh, well, in the period since 1989, China has essentially increased its GDP by almost 15 times. Other countries like Russia can do it too. Russia has a lot of potential, but it needs to have the right policies. And I think this is the direction in which the present situation is pushing Russia. And of course, as both of you pointed out, this is creating a, uh, 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 we, we sometimes call it a multipolar world. It's certainly dividing the world away from the West and creating new uh, 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 relationships between uh, uh, countries, particularly the closeness between Russia and China is very important here. Well, the Ukrainian and Russian situation uh, in many ways has inverted uh, the whole traditional drive uh, of imperialism. I mean, you and I have spoken for uh, decades about uh, uh, imperialism being economic. And uh, even when Karl Marx talked about uh, British expansion into India, he gave a speech before the Chartists saying, well, at least uh, English imperialism is going to break down the backwardness of India and other countries, and it's going to introduce uh, capitalism, and uh, that'll be the first step towards socialism in these countries. This is not what is occurring in uh, Ukraine uh, or in the uh, neoliberal breakup uh, of, of Russia. Uh, the, and in fact, you, we can, you can look at Ukraine and, and Russia in, in the last 30 years and say the whole geo political theory uh, of uh, economic uh, priority, the idea that economics drives politics, uh, doesn't seem to be the case 
uh, today. Uh, neither uh, industry nor uh, labor is benefiting. Uh, you're seeing Germany already agreeing to subsidize uh, the high uh, gas and uh, oil prices uh, to support uh, buying its uh, liquid national ga gas uh, uh, from the United States at six times uh, the price that Russia was charging. That's not economic. Uh, you, you have German industry unable to stop the dismantling of German industry by dismantling the trade, the energy trade and the food trade with Russia that was what gave uh, German industry its uh, competitive advantage. That's now gone. And that's, as, that's irreversible, not because of anything that uh, President Putin is saying, we're turning uh, eastward, but because uh, the US demands uh, to turn Europe into a client oligarchies has made it uh, irreversible. Uh, you're, uh, if uh, the German government supports industry by saying, okay, we're going to uh, uh, give money to the uh, industry so it can uh, depend entirely on the United States for materials we used to import from Russia, then given the fact that we have to balance our budget according to the EU uh, rules, we're going to have to cut back uh, social spending, especially now that we have to vastly increase our arms spending to replace all of the uh, old obsolete arms that we've uh, sent to Ukraine with uh, brand new uh, US arms. There really isn't going to be any uh, opportunity for a social democratic uh, economic program uh, in Germany. Well, it's hard to see how economic self-interest justifies uh, this uh, inversion, this reversal of uh, European policy, uh, because it's led to America's destruction of German uh, industry. And not only that, but by destroying German industry, you've destroyed the demand for skilled labor. Uh, are we going to see uh, German labor emigrating just like it has from uh, the Baltic states, 20% uh, loss in population from uh, Latvia, Estonia, uh, and Lithuania. Uh, but there's another thing that also Europe has lost by this. Uh, and when uh, uh, Russia and China are turning away from Europe, they're not turning away from the Europe that was going social democratic, from the Europe that actually held out ideals in times past, but from the fact that Europe is no longer so social democratic. It's lost its former socialist labor policy. Germany's Lynx party has broken up over the Ukraine war. Uh, and uh, the United States political meddling has turned Europe social democratic and labor parties into neoliberal uh, proxies, uh, the Tony Blairism of uh, German politics and uh, French politics and uh, all, all over Europe. So the result is that not only a client political uh, oligarchy, but also a client political uh, labor force. There's no uh, labor movement in uh, Europe to uh, oppose uh, what, what's happening here. Uh, after 1991, let's say again, what if economics governed European uh, uh, policy. Uh, well, after 1991, Europe hoped at least to gain economic dominance over Central Europe, Russia, and uh, as you pointed out, Ukraine. Uh, but now it's losing Eurasia. Uh, uh, Annalena Baerbock says that uh, any kind of trade is a risk. And uh, if you trade with Russia or China, she said, then you're taking the risk that they can do to Europe what America does to uh, uh, the rest of the world. They can cut you off with sanctions and disrupt your economy by uh, refusing to export to you. And Europe can only be safe if it doesn't export, uh, import anything that it needs from China or Russia or uh, the rest of the global majority. Only the United States can be depended upon uh, to help uh, Europe develop just as it helped uh, uh, Germany develop by blowing up the uh, Nord Stream pipelines and uh, restructuring its, uh, its energy trade. So this is the craziness of what Germany's foreign minister uh, herself is saying. Uh, I don't know how you can ever say that this is uh, an economic uh, explanation of things. It's, uh, the fact is it's, it's ethnic and racist hatred of Russia. It's Nazism. It's not social democracy. Europe has now uh, uh, embraced Nazism. And uh, I think this is best symbolized uh, over the weekend by uh, the uh, Zelensky's meeting with the Pope wearing two Nazi symbols on his shirt.
just to make it very clear, hey, maybe we can reestablish the uh, papal Nazi uh, pact of the, uh, of the 1930s and uh, the rat line and everything. So Europe has lost its profitable investment future with Russia, and now it seems China too. Uh, and it's uh, it completely tied itself to the United States. Uh, is that, can you, how do you explain that economically in terms of self-interest? You can't. Mick. We're still discussing Russia, right? Well, it's a Europe um, too. Yeah, I started to talk about um, Europe. Um, can can you show the second slide? I'll make a comment. Um, Michael, Michael just talked about the way in which some of the decisions, you know, the extraordinary decisions made by the political leaders of European countries. Um, and the ways in which the complete absence, it seems, of any strategic autonomy in Europe has led to actions, you know, that make a bad situation worse. They make a, they make a bad situation worse in the sense that they've disrupted relationships with Russia, especially energy relationship, food relationships, and also de-risking generates serious risks where Europe is very, very dependent upon a whole range of intermediate goods that are actually produced in China and supplied to European industry by China. No, Europe, European industries, and indeed all the G7 industries, face serious challenges in any case, you know, which are to some extent linked, you know, to the fact that after the uh, economic crisis in the 1970s, neoliberalism was in a sense adopted as a solution. It was adopted as a solution in the sense when you saw this offshoring of industry, you did indeed, you know, see increases in the profitability of companies that are offshored. But if you actually look at the productivity growth of the G7 countries, this is the average productivity growth, labor productivity, hourly productivity, you can see that it has basically steadily declined. So in a sense, you know, the economic performance of the G7, which includes a number of major European countries and, of course, the United States, Canada and so on, has progressively defined, declined. And it's declined, you know, because of a decline in productive investment, you know, which partly reflects profitability considerations and the, the relative profitability of investments in, in, in financial activities and, and in a whole series of speculative activities linked to real estate and to stock markets and so on. So first challenge, you know, that Europe already faces is, in a sense, the challenge of overcoming that, de that relative decline in productivity. But I mean, in seeking to confront that challenge, you know, by acting in the way in which it has in the last few years, and in a sense, becoming a kind of um, part of the world that is almost completely dominated by the United States and by its interests. I mean, Europe has done itself considerable damage. But I think the other thing that's very striking about what is happening as far as Europe is concerned is that, you know, because of the way in which the world order is changing, you know, the kind of resources available for the former colonial powers are more diminished. So in that situation, the United States is seeking to seize a much larger share of these resources for itself by requiring Europe, for example, to purchase expensive US energy rather than Russian energy through, you know, new measures which are designed to perhaps encourage the relocation of European industries in the United States. So in a sense, what you see is a kind of also a kind of inter-imperial rivalry, you know, between Europe and the United States, with the United States exploiting its dominant position in order to secure a greater volume of resources for itself. Absolutely. Yeah, Mick. Uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to say you, you use the term inter-imperial rivalry, but I would say that essentially uh, going back to even the 19th century and certainly in the 20th century, the United States has always wanted to uh, 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 essentially... Um, uh, 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 well, uh, 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 essentially contain or roll back European imperialisms in order to open up the world economy to itself. That has always been its goal. It's continuing to attempt this, even though, of course, it is farther away from realization than ever before. The rest of the world economy is turning away from it. But, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're basically now on to, to discussing uh, 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 Europe. And I, I want to say a couple of things about that. But I did want to say one final thing about Russia before we leave that topic entirely and that is that you know basically uh, 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 what Russia has uh, what is happening now is that there was a 
it, it can be explained by what happened to post-communist Russia. Essentially, Russia was uh, 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 Russia was plunged into economic chaos and retardation in the 1990s under shock therapy, um, and in the 2000s under Putin's leadership, uh, 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 you know, uh, Putin managed to stabilize Russia to a considerable extent, but. Already then it was very clear that if the West had its way, this is what would happen to Russia. What happened to Russia in the 1990s? And in the course of the period over the next two decades, what the Putin government tried to do is to try to say to the West that, look, you know, you have to, uh, uh, we would like to have good relations with you, but not on those terms. You have to accept our own uh, uh, interests and, and, and uh, naturally economic interests, security interests and so on. And that possibility of essentially trying uh, uh, to have a more balanced relationship with the West uh, has been destroyed. The West has basically refused it. It has continued to expand NATO, etc. So now uh, the, the, the this decisive uh, 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 reorientation of Russia, the realization that the West no longer has anything to offer Russia that it uh, that is valuable. This is uh, you know this has the that that history. But yeah, com coming to Europe, you know, I mean the to me the headline uh, in terms of discussing what's happening in Europe is are they crazy? I mean why why are they undertaking such a uh, a suicidal policy where their industrial base is being destroyed as Michael you pointed out and 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 also the industrial base is being destroyed now quite actively uh with the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline the cutting off of the most sensible source of energy for Europe which is energy from Russia uh, uh and then making uh, uh, moreover uh, Europe uh, reliant on energy from the United United States, which uh, not only is more expensive, so creating economic problems, but also setting Europe back from its climate goals because uh, imported LNG, LNG shipped from the United States to uh, 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 to Europe, will have a carbon footprint which is eight to ten times higher than natural gas being supplied by pipeline uh, from Russia. So, in all of these ways, the, Euro the Europeans seem to be uh, intent on a degree of self destruction that I think is is uh, is amazing, and and I I still don't fully understand what animates it. But I can certainly note two things. Number one. There is considerable public discontent. And number two, there is also, a presu I mean, I think there is a fair degree of discontent in the elite classes because the, the industrialists' interests are being destroyed as well. So what, what is going to happen in Europe is, is, is an open question. Uh, certainly, we can see the Europeans, they may have gone along with, or at least they may have appeared to go along with the United States with imposing sanctions and so on. But if you look closely at the sanctions, they're also designed to minimize the impact on uh, Europe and the fact of the matter is Europe remains uh, 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 you know Europe's reliance on Russian energy may have decreased but Russian energy is still being pumped uh, uh, to Europe even as we speak so uh, but 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 in in, in terms of uh, uh, extending this hostility that is now being directed from Europe to Russia we can see that the Europeans are certainly hesitating and poking at that. So uh, there is there is that dimension. And uh, so, yeah, we will have to see how long this uh, unity that the West has in, uh, has proclaimed, you know, the unity they have found over the conflict over Ukraine, how long it will last and how long it will be before the economic hurt that is being inflicted on Europe will essentially produce some kind of uh, pushback. Well, Radhika, you asked the question, are they crazy? Well, in a way, yes, they are in the sense that you and I each have gone to the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation meetings in uh, Berlin. And uh, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in East Germany. They were traumatized by the Soviet occupation there. So traumatized that uh, it's, uh, it's almost an unthinking opposition to uh, anything that Russia does. And it's this anti-Russia feeling that America has been able to, <coughs> to fan and encourage that uh, uh, has led uh, the Germans to say, yes, we're willing to sacrifice our industry. Uh, we're, we, uh, uh, we saw what happened under Russia. Uh, now let's turn to the United States, not realizing that uh, what the United States is doing is uh, going to make be uh, equally bad 
uh, what happened in East Germany. Uh, they've, uh, they were tapping uh, Angela Merkel's phones. They're still uh, uh, wiretapping. Uh, my main source of Russian information is Johnson's Russia list. And uh, Johnson just went to uh, France and uh, Germany to take a vacation two weeks ago and uh, said that he was surprised to find that you can't get uh, any access to RT. Uh, or uh, Russian uh, news on the internet. Everything's blocked. Uh, there's total thought control uh, in, in Europe. This, again, is a, a total uh, inversion of everything that was supposed to be uh, democratic. And uh, this is pushed to the uh, really insane point uh, that when uh, Baerbock says uh, anything we import uh, from Russia or China can potentially be used for the military. If you import Russia food, that could be used to uh, uh, feed Russian soldiers to fight in Ukraine. And so that uh, food is uh, military. We, we can't uh, rely on for national security purposes on that. Uh, uh, we've got to follow the Dutch and not uh, permit the exportation of uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, scanning machinery to uh, edge, edge uh, information technology uh, uh, chips. Uh, we've got to really break off uh, all trade. Well, as you know, when so much uh, trade uh, b b is already with uh, Russia and China and Eurasia, uh, having a sharp cutoff is going to mean a pr prolonged uh, depression there. And uh, there's no indication that a European depression is going to lead uh, to a left-wing solution. If the U.S. has, it, has its way, it will lead to a uh, uh, 1930 uh, Nazi-type uh, a solution, uh, just as the United States is promoted in uh, uh, in Ukraine and in uh, the other countries that it's uh, uh, taken forward. So Europe may look end up looking like a Latin American dictatorship, uh, like uh, uh, Chile under Pinochet. Um, Mick, um, can I if I just say one thing, which is that. Um, one also needs to recognize that in some respects, you know, the structure of the economies of Europe, you know, have some parallels with the structure of the economies of North America. I mean, they're, they're economies with very high GDPs, but actually their GDP enormously overstates, you know, their um, real wealth in many ways, you know, in part because the GDP includes all sorts of in, imputations. It includes a whole series of immaterial services, you know, that basically derive from intangible assets that are associated with what? Copyright, patent, trademarks, intellectual property rights, and the control of supply chains. So a significant, you know, amount of European wealth, in a sense, derives also, you know, from those sorts of sources. I mean, this control over IP, for example, is associated with excessive markups, high service payments. It prevents the diffusion of technologies, of products that could make considerable contributions to the improvement of human livelihoods throughout the world because they remain so expensive. And in fact, we know, we know that what in a sense drives development is the rapid diffusion, adoption, repetition, you know, of investments. But this system, you know, prevents it. But this system is one which generates large rents, you know, for economically advanced countries. And associated with these rents are a lot of interests, you know, that are you know, not connected with manufacturing industry and maybe that seem prepared to sacrifice it, you know, and to sacrifice the people who work in it in order to preserve some alternative kind of future. But I mean, to me, that world is scarcely viable, you know, outside of a kind of colonial and imperial world order. And in that sense, you know, I agree absolutely with what you're saying about the naivety and apparent stupidity, crass stupidity of many of the leaders of European countries. No, exactly. And, and you know, uh, what this, you make a very important point, Mick. Um, the GDP of many Western countries, particularly the United States, is vastly exaggerated for the reasons you state. And also because uh, finance in particular constitutes such a large part 
of of this and essentially what is finance finance is actually not production finance it only involves the transfer of wealth from some to others so that in a certain sense the very thing which is harming the us economy which is creating inequality is actually counted as economic wealth and of course the making of financial profits only benefits a small number of people to enjoy the labor of other people for next to nothing i mean that's essentially what it is i also want to say one other thing which is you know obviously one of the implications of what all of us have been saying is that it is important you know today you know you showed the labor productivity graph what would be required to turn that around what would be required to increase labor productivity in european countries western countries more generally it would be some kind of industrial policy it would be a, a, a set of policies which are totally the opposite of neoliberalism monetary policies fiscal policies industrial policies blah blah so everything the opposite of neoliberalism but after 40 years of applying neoliberalism it is a moot question whether these countries are ever going to be in a in a position to be able to implement serious industrial policy the very structure of these societies the relationship between states and capitalist classes has changed to such an extent so uh, increasingly i have been noting that both in the united states and in europe there is uh, you know industrial policy is being revived as a topic of discussion everybody is saying we need industrial policy etc but if you look closely if you read between the lines what is passing for industrial policy is essentially a policy which is neoliberalism which is to say giving more and more subsidies to big corporations so the germans under the rubric of industrial policy are essentially discussing whether they should give subsidies to ibm or to some uh, german manufacturers or, or or what have you but that's all it is and you don't that's not industrial policy it's just the continuation of neoliberalism why because neoliberalism for all the talk of free markets and free trade has ever been only about governments uh, uh, favoring big corporations by giving them all sorts of goodies cheap credit privatize you know uh, uh, privatizing assets at fire sale prices so these countries get ever these companies get ever bigger giving them subsidies in the name of r d and what have you and uh, of course providing all sorts of other services so really uh, it seems as though the road out of all this for Europe is is also going to be very difficult, even if there arise forces that are determined to, to seek to attempt that. So what you've described as neoliberalism is exactly what uh, uh, Nick uh, has called uh, a rentier policy. Uh, and a rentier policy pretends to be economic growth, but it's really overhead. Absolutely. So we will bring this ninth geopolitical economy hour to an end. Uh, and uh, see you next time. We will continue this discussion then. Bye bye.